All right, here we go. Clark Kent, what's good? Yeah, it's, it's great to be here. I'm just trying to have fun with it, man. Yeah, man. So let's start from the beginning. Because, you know, you, you interviewed for Sneaker Watch of Vlad TV before, but this is the first time that you and I are actually sitting down on camera. Yeah, well, I feel honored that I get to speak to you, actually. Yeah, likewise. Especially considering we go back before Vlad TV. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, we both have been doing this for a very long time. You longer than I, but we're both OGs with this shit. Yeah, for sure. So you know what's interesting? I'm watching The Get Down right now. Mm -hmm. Well, what's interesting about The Get Down is in the show, in the Bronx, well, actually New York in general, mm -hmm. there was only a couple of DJ crews. But then the riots in New York broke out. Yeah. There was a blackout, and everyone started looting the stores. Yeah. And after that, people had equipment, you know, to be DJs. Right. And apparently, you were one of those people. Wow. Yeah, I was. Um, around, my, around my area in Brooklyn, um, there was a shop up near Eastern Parkway and everybody raided into it. And um, me and uh, one of my friends, I'm not gonna name names, we went and got a DJ set and rolled it all the way home. Because I was already knew how to DJ, but like we knew that the store was being raided, so we just went and joined in. And that was my first set of turntables. Funny part is, funny part is I got these turntables and they had a mixer and everything, but I had no amps, no speakers, so it was like, Okay, what'd you get that for? But it, it was, and it lasted for a while. Okay, so like, describe what the DJ culture was like back then. Um, funny enough, it was about playing great music. It wasn't about a certain style. It was because if 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 you look at what we deem hip hop, hip hop is built off of the records that were before hip hop because we were finding the breaks and putting them together to create a certain feel of music, but I played all kinds of music. I didn't play to be creating hip hop. I played to be playing great music. So DJ wise, it was about being able to mix records properly, selecting records that work well together and actually knowing music. I can't say it's the I can't say it's the same anymore. This is true. Yeah, definitely. It's about yeah. celebrity right now. Being a DJ means how popular you are. True, true. I, and that, that's not the case for me. For me, um, it's always going to be how do you feel about music and how do you translate how you feel about music with playing it. So, I mean, during that time, because you grew up in Brooklyn, right? 100%. Yeah, so like during that time, how important was Grandmaster Flash and what was becoming hip-hop back then in the DJ culture? Well, Grandmaster Flash was the guy who turned the corner. You know what I'm saying? Everything else before that was mixing records and finding sections of records that were good, but it was more mixing records. Grandmaster Flash, that quick mix made us all want to extend breaks and, and, and make records feel different. And he was, he was the best at it at that precise moment. Okay, so you're DJing, then you become Dana Dane's DJ? Yeah, that happened at a, a, um, a talent show. Dana Dane's record came out, and let's say it came out the week before, a week goes by, he's doing a show at a talent show at Washington Irving High School, and I'm the DJ. And he goes, yo, could you throw these records on for me? And I throw the record on, and then after, right after, he's like, yo, why don't you just be my DJ? Why don't we just do some shows together? And the funny thing with Dana Dane's record is, his first record came out, and it was like a smash like four days later. So it, it didn't even have a time to or maybe it'll build and grow. It was, records out, you're hot. So he went from putting a record out to doing shows like every other day. So he needed a DJ and I, I became his DJ. And the funny part is he had a DJ. I guess he just wasn't the one to be going on the road with. I, I try to say this without sounding a certain way, but when Dana Dane met me, I was already DJ Clark Kent. I was already playing clubs. I was already being hired to be in places and do events and do parties. It's just that that was another thing that I was doing. So the, he was the first rapper, I would say, that I was a, a DJ for. First it was him, then it was uh, a, a few R&B groups and Jay and Big and Puff and Rakim and, you know, lots of stuff like that. Okay, so let's build a timeline here. So you got your turntables, you started to get hired as a professional DJ, mm -hmm. you hook up with Dana Dane. What was sort of the next step, the next break you had? Uh, 
I would have to say, if I looked at the next break in my career, I would have to say um, remixing records. When that happened, um, like yeah, everything just kind of switched. Uh, and because the first record I made was a, a hit record, so luckily it worked and it worked well. And I was on the radio with Molly Ma, and then I was on the radio with uh, Dr. Dre. So like all of those things were happening at the same time. And once that, that happened, it was like, okay, phew, because once that record hit, the record company said, well, hey, you're doing well on the radio. This record works. Why don't you come in and do what you do on the radio, but do it with artists that don't have it? So basically, I'm breaking records on the radio. Come and find artists that you can break. And what was the record that you produced? Uh, Sky's the Limit by um, Troop. Um, no, Sky's the, Spread My Wings by Troop. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah. And um, by Troop. Yeah, by Troop. Yeah. So, and the record was was big. It became the the actual single version and the one when you see a video, the version you see in the video is the version that I made. So Okay. So how did you transition from spinning records to actually making beats? Well, I was spinning records for Dana Dane and Dana Dane's producer was Herbie Lovebug and I was friends with Hot Day from from um from Queensbridge. So we would always go to Molly Ma's crib. And when Dana was recording, he was recording in Bayside and in um, Power Play Studios. So we'd always see Paul C. And Herbie made beats. And I was around Herbie a lot because he went out on the road with us. So when he was making beats, I was watching. And then when we would go to Molly's crib, Molly's making beats, I was watching. And I just learned how to make beats. Paul C., I watched him do it. You know what I'm saying? I saw Patrick Adams make records. Patrick Adams mixed like half of the best rap records at that precise moment. But he's from Brooklyn, I saw him make records. So I just one day started tapping on Herbie's machine in Bayside and it just happened. Yeah. And that was like what, the SP-1200 back then? Yeah, that was actually a SP-12 and then the 1200 came later. Yeah, it was it was hard, you had this, this floppy disk or whatever. I remember um, Dana, at, at one point, after he saw that I figured it out with her, he bought a machine and um, he was like, he was going to start making music. And I would be like, yo, let me borrow that, let me borrow that, let me borrow that. And he would ever so often let me use it, but I would always have to give it back. So then at one point, I just was like, I'm just going to get my own. And from you that know what's point, crazy is that I used to produce all the time. I wasn't that great at mm -hmm. it. So. But I actually had an SP-12. <laughs> And they got rid of it like a few weeks later because the sample time was only like five seconds. It, it was it's just funny like because seriously, it's low. funny because SP12 the sample was the sampling was ten seconds. It's yeah. just that it was spread differently. And then when you got the SP1200, the only thing that was really different was the sampling. You you had a floppy disk instead of having to get a Commodore drive for it, but it was the same sampling. Oh, was it? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I never got the 1200. I got the 12, yeah. but I was already messing around with the MPC 60 by that time. So I'm like, okay, this yeah. is a new technology. Okay, so you're producing R&B records. What was sort of the next big thing to happen in your career? Um, I think the next big thing I would have to say is um, I, I, I linked up with, um, I started to, to try to figure out how to sign Jay-Z. Because you know, in doing that remix and then being able to do more remixes, I started to put Jay on every remix. Because he was, one, he was my friend. Two, I thought he was the best, so I just wanted to put him everywhere. So I was doing that so that people would pay attention, so that people would say, oh, wait, this guy's dope. You know, so that really, like, turned the corner, convincing him to rap again. <laughs> okay, so what records were you putting Jay-Z on? Sucks. I put him on Glenn Jones. I put him on Rude Boys. I put him on High Five. I put him and Ski on High Five. But like, if if it was a record that I was remixing, I put him on SWV. I put him on Horace Brown. Like, I put him on. I tried to put him on almost every record I, I was making. If it was a remix. Now, what was the thing about Jay Z that made you realize that he was going to be the next dude? Well, I said it from when I first met him when he was rhyming with Jazz, and. If you knew him, you knew that he didn't only rap that way. So for me, it wasn't about 
the way he rapped. It was about the things he said when he rapped. Because if you listen to anything that he did back then, it was super witty. So it was super witty, super tricky, double entendres, triple entendres. And to me, to be better, you had to be witty. You know what I'm saying? Like, look how witty Kane was. Look how witty uh, the, the guys that we think were the best were, like the Coogee raps. You know what I'm saying? Like, look who, like how witty those guys were. They made you want to keep paying attention to rhymes. And he was like witty on a 10th power. That was because he was around a dude who was super witty himself with Jazz O. And I think they complimented each other so much and they forced each other to be better all the time. And, um, you know, there you have it. And then you got a good dude like Rakim who's just like out of this world amazing. And you look at these guys and you're trying to figure out how do I rhyme better? And they just were trying to rhyme better and better and better. But I, I noticed between him and Jazz, like Jazz was to me the best. And then you meet this guy and then this guy's like just as good as Jazz, but then he has this other thing, like maybe like this, a different swagger. and. It just makes you go, well, there's something different about this guy. But when I was trying to convince him to rap again, I was trying to convince Jazz and Jay to rap again because I wanted them to rap together. And then they introduced me to Sauce Money, and now I'm like, well, there's three of them, so now I got to figure it all out. What do you think about the whole situation? Man, my point of view, man, I really feel like they tried to paint a, a bad picture on my brother and tried to make him look like, like he was a hater or uh, it was some envy, jealousy type shit, you know what I'm saying? And actuality, you know what I'm saying? Bro, been having this shit, man. He been in the condo. I got my hat on and I had my Coke bottles up under my hat. And I'm sitting at the dinner table like an asshole with the hat on, knowing she gonna tell me to take it off. And I'm just sitting there just gawping down, you know, in my zone. She said, take that goddamn hat off at the dinner table. I'm like, come on, mom. Coke everywhere. 